Thank you everyone for having me today. I'm Mary Strain. I'm from AWS. I lead their business development activities for artificial intelligence and machine learning, mostly in education, not educational technology, higher education, and K-12. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with this group today and share a little bit about um, what I'm seeing in the market relative to education and other industries as we also support academic medical centers and public sector agencies as well as share a little bit about what we're seeing in the market relative to regulatory environment and responsible AI. Um, I'm going to speak very quickly because I do want to allow some time for conversation afterwards. And I'm from Philadelphia, so I speak very quickly. Over. Uh, this slide is, is a terrible slide. It really just highlights what we um, at AWSC is our legacy of 20 years of supporting artificial intelligence and machine learning for over 100,000 customers worldwide. And it, this extensive service is really you know, it's impossible to read, but it highlights how we think about this market and the world the next uh, explosion across artificial intelligence and machine learning. And so again, although we've been working in this space for 20 years, we all know that we're at a tipping point now for generative AI, the availability of compute resources and just sheer volume of data is allowing folks to think about generative AI or you know, the chat GPT, which is sort of the famous name for it now, um, has become increasingly popular and very important for accelerating research scholarship, commercial entities, all of it. So I don't really have to tell this group, everybody here is probably smarter than me, but generative AI is the ability to use large foundation models, vast, vast quantities of data to essentially create novel content, so new content one time um, at an academic conference and everybody lost their mind. It's not new, it's novel, it uses um, you know, reasoning capabilities from neural networks to allow people to generate novel information and make new insights from just vast, vast quantities of data. So I like to say, you know, when we think about knowledge that's generated from the internet, what could go wrong? <laughs> and we, we all know this, we see this across the board, that there is a serious challenges related to hallucinations. It is wrong, it is wrong often, and it is convincingly wrong. And in the areas where I work in the public sector, rather than academics and in public sector agencies, the existential value of the university is its premium content, its accuracy does not support misinformation, disinformation, inaccuracies. So we need to think about how we can support with technology and with policy ways to improve uh, the accuracy of generative AI capabilities. Uh, also, anybody who's spent any time on the internet knows that it's filled with bias and misinformation and disinformation and lots of toxic content. So how can we both build technology and policy to avoid the proliferation of toxic and biased content through the use of generative AI and all of its capabilities. Copyright and IP, and I know that's the primary uh, focus for a lot of folks here today. So, you know, we already see you know, artists, movie stars, folks who are suing uh, various generative AI companies because they don't, they don't correctly attribute information that's generated from the author. And then lastly, security and policy. I'm sorry, <laughs> behind me. Security, uh, so how do we ensure that these foundation models who are so very, very, very smart because we feed them information all the time, every prompt, every question, every set of data that we're feeding to these very large language models uses that information to generate new content. And how do we protect student information, HR information, proprietary information, from being used by foundation models and then uh, shared with others. So that security is a, is a critical element of how we're thinking technically and policy-wise moving forward. And you know, what we're seeing is an emerging regulatory environment. So lots of folks are using generative AI capabilities. They're deploying them now both to academic institutions and in the commercial sector. But it's really an unknown regulatory environment to date. We're seeing state-level agencies in the United States come up with ed executive um, pronouncements and, and information, but they're very, very high level. We saw a recent um, you know, executive announcement from the White House about two weeks ago relative to both managing very, very large foundation models, but also policy around research and investments in supporting ethical AI. And then I was sharing earlier, you might want to take a look. It's interesting, the Council of Great City Schools, which is the United States governing body for the largest K-12 school systems in the country, 
gathered a group of CIOs and came up with a 93 item checklist to assist CIOs and superintendents in thinking about not only how they build and deploy generative AI capabilities to students, but really, frankly, more importantly, how they're consuming them from their commercial partners. So their learning management systems, their student information systems, the curriculum providers are all building generative AI capabilities. And these uh, public sector agencies don't know how to consume correctly and how to ensure privacy. So I would recommend if you want to take a look at what I think is probably the most prescriptive guidance in the public sector. It's coming from the Council of Great Cities Goals. So given the unknown regulatory environment, given the challenges that we already know about the, the uh, potential risks associated with generative AI, how is AWS thinking about this as a technology provider to support organizations? And I think that this is more than just how AWS is thinking about it. I think it's about how we need to be thinking about a technology that by the time I finish this talk, we will have new information about it, right? There will be changes. So AWS's approach, which many of you might say, you know, where have you been? I like to say we were not delayed, we were deliberative <laughs> in this process. Taking into account what we saw gaps. So the first approach for AWS is that we believe that there is not one foundation model that will rule them all. So when we think about large commercially available models, incredibly performant, 300 billion parameters, but what we're seeing in the market is increasingly large numbers of foundation models being built. So models of extra, extra large size, but also models that are smaller and domain specific. For example, Bloomberg GPT, which is funding to tuned for the financial services industry. We're also seeing healthcare and clinical models that are being developed to improve the accuracy of generative AI capabilities. We also have to consider not just the uh, accuracy and domain specificity of a marketplace of models, but also cost. When we think about a 300 billion parameter model, and I work a lot with educational technology firms, and you're talking about uh, you know, 100 million API calls a day, the cost becomes completely untenable. So can we get the same performance from generative AI capabilities from smaller models that are less compute intensive and more cost effective? And then when we talk about the regulatory space, I think it's important particularly for researchers and universities and other public sector agencies to think about what is the future state of regulatory environment that may require an open source model to be used for research? may require a domain-specific model developed by a government agency or an, an independent organization to be used to improve accuracy, to have more explainability, to have more openness on the training data so that we're able to ensure more responsible AI going forward. So that flexibility as an architecture, I think, is incredibly important to build a future-facing ecosystem for your organizations as you look forward. How do we adopt and, and innovate with this marketplace of foundation models available. By default, uh, you know, AWS makes uh, hosts large foundation models and makes them available to organizations, but we do not ever share any organizational data with any of our own personal, uh, our, our own proprietary foundation models or any of the third party models that we work with. So again, that's a default position for security architecture that makes us unique in the market. AWS is also leveraging our silicon, our infrastructure, our compute resources to make it a cost-effective approach. We announced Amazon Bedrock, and just to highlight, I think when we talk about the flexibility of foundation models, this is our foundation model uh, managed service approach. But what you'll see here is Amazon's own models, but again, models that are built for purpose for different industries, different specificities around uh, you know, text-to-image or image-to-text, Models like Anthropic, which is a constitutional AI model built on the UN Commission for Human Rights in terms of how they built out the training data associated with it. And then, of course, the ability to work with publicly available models through our Amazon StageMaker machine learning environment. So again, lots of toys, lots of, lots of flexibility to meet, again, emerging regulatory requirements or other uh, potential future states. So we actually add new models to StageMaker So how are we be seeing this being used? Of course, across many, many industries, I think we're only at the very, very infancy of this technology and understanding what the capabilities can be. 
I like to think of uh, artificial intelligence as with people, not instead of people. So how do we augment the capability of individuals across industries? And um, the other you know, trademark Mary stream is, I think artificial intelligence is great for things you don't want to do anymore. <laughs> so the, the trivial information, um, you know, looking at extra large data sets, summarizing content, generating information, eliminating processes that provide that create friction for consumers or students or faculty across your institutions. I want to dive a little bit in on what I'm seeing in the higher education space. This is the space that I work most often in, but lots and lots of ways to create virtual chatbots and tutors for students on learning content, summarizing content, opening up libraries by digitizing content and allowing um, interaction directly with resources, and then lots and lots of great uh, efficiencies on the administrative side. So taking your own internal knowledge base or your own internal compliance requirements and providing coaching and documentation to help folks you know, more rapidly um, answer questions, meet needs, and, and generate reports. An interesting project on athletics, which I just think is fun, but I think it has transversal applications, is we're working with a university that takes high school athletics, and at this university, athletics is a big deal. They take high school athletes who are who they're trying to recruit, they look at video of them, they look at statistics about their academic performance and their performance on the field, and they use that to generate a one-page summary. This one institution is looking at 1,000 quarterbacks coming into their school for the next year. So how do they create a, a really equitable uh, way for coaches to have a one-page summary of this individual's potential, and then they compare it to the same statistics for successful quarterbacks at that, in, at that institution over time. So it gives them a, a sort of apples-to-apples -apples comparison and allows them to look at far more students. When I think about that, we can think about that in terms of admissions, we can think about that in terms of hiring, we can think about that, about that in terms of customer profiles. These are some use cases that we're seeing on the research side, both on bioinformatics, on the um, mechanical engineering, all kinds of use cases to generate new insights using generative AI uh, over vast, vast quantities of data sets. And I think that's sort of the theme here, you know, using it to um, gain insights that a human being simply can't because of the volume of data that you're looking at. And I did want to highlight, this is AWS's approach to responsible AI at a very high level. And I think we can probably spend half a day on this slide and this conversation. And I do want to uh, dial in on a few things that I think are critically important when we think about deploying artificial intelligence, not just in educational settings or in academic settings or on the public, on the commercial side. We need to be thinking about how these technologies align to our own institutional values. Not just in sort of how we deploy them, but also in how we're building out solutions to meet specific needs. I think when, when we think of artificial intelligence, there's a lot of sense that there's a robot overlord. Anybody? <laughs> uh, so how do we frame the conversation to be thinking about how, how artificial intelligence actually increases access? How does it increase agency? You know, when we talk about transforming a financial aid process where students don't have to wait to call the financial aid office between 10 and 2 on Tuesdays and Thursdays because that's when they're willing to take calls from students because they're totally overwhelmed and we can create a chatbot experience that allows them to watch their financial aid package. That's transformative. It gives them access. It gives them the agency not just to the learning content happening at an academic institution but to the institution and the processes itself. So I think we can really reframe the conversation about how we align artificial intelligence capabilities to our own values around student agency, equity, and access. Uh, uh, I just very quickly, um, transparency and explainability about the design of these solutions, how you're using foundation models that, again, align to your values. Are you using open source models? Are you using training data that has a constitutional framework? Um, you know, uh, training and education for your uh, organization to support uh, effective procurement processes and policies, et cetera. This is a little out of, I, this, uh, out of the loop, but I did want to highlight because of this is a research institution, we are working with projects across the world to help create um, AI augmented research assistance. So again, things that are um, 
a little bit easier for artificial intelligence to do, like summarizing abstracts, scheduling interviews, summarizing interviews. So this is just a use case that I thought might be of interest when we talk about sort of augmenting capabilities across institutions. That was it. So I appreciate your time. I'd love to have just uh, any conversation. I would. One of the questions I like to ask audiences that I speak to is, oh, "What terrifies you about this technology?" Anyone? Yes. What you're listening to in your house. Oh, <laughs> with the Alexa? Yeah. No, agree. So security and privacy, right? Paramount. How are you, as organizations, are protecting for a, the most secure environment possible? And I can say, you know, just from our own perspective, that you know, is with generative AI, the ability to have a default architecture that does not use any of that data to train foundation models is a unique position in the market. You know, in terms of what I don't have one in my house. <laughs> Turn it off. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Incorrect result delivered with the power. Yes. Exactly, and I think that that we are working um, extensively with an architecture called Retrieval Augmented Generative AI, which allows organizations to send our first-party content uh, in a sort of a you know it's not a wealth garden, but in a separate environment that allows you to call in generative AI capabilities, but to have it essentially as background knowledge for natural language and reasoning only on your first-party content. So it's 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 a opportunity for organizations to essentially fine tune without having to have a big large language model that they're fine tuning themselves, but you're centering your first party content, which improves the accuracy as it typically only reflects that content and is using the large language models to have uh, reasoning and language capabilities to respond to prompts. That's a you could follow up on that. Anyone else you had a question? Yes, it's um, not <laughs> From my AWS perspective, what do you see this uh, Gen AI is doing in terms of the reliability? Is it getting better or uh, is it still usable from afar? Yeah, no, it's certainly getting better, right? Um, and I think getting better because it is both the proliferation of available foundation models, but I am very excited about domain specific models. So, models that are trained on sets of data that are more finely tuned for specific purposes on the clinical side or on an education side. A lot of my colleagues are working with nations in Europe and Asia to develop their own language models because, frankly, the large language models that are commercially available now do not reflect the cultural assets or the language of many of those countries. So again, when I see that, that gives me a lot of hope and excitement to sort of a, a more global perspective. Um, and more information, I think we get better results when we have a, a larger data set. Anyone else? Yes. Um, Mary, you, you mentioned uh, costs becoming untenable when you get into large language models. And I know AWS has many variables that you bill against. Lots when, of variables. Yeah. There, I think last time I looked, it was over 40. But anyway, the, the point of, of my question is, you know, where do you see the greatest increase in cost by implementing AI against the service? This is a great question. Use, right? Because most of the projects I'm working on uh, are new. Nobody knows what the use case is going to be for a student to be able to interrogate lecture content, right? But they haven't done it before. Nobody knows what it looks like to have students have unfettered access to their own student information system and be able to text, what's my GPA? How can I, um, how many classes do I have to take if I want to have double major in economics? You know, those kind, that use is, at this point, difficult to calculate because we don't know. So one is sort of those API calls in the volume, right? And then the other one, I think, is people's default is to use very, very large, highly performant um, foundation models that require our compute intensive, so there's latency issues. And to get beyond that, you need even more throughput, which is a cost factor. So I, I see people eventually saying, OK, for these use cases, I know I'm going to have a million users asking questions of this continent. Uh, so I need to have a model that maybe is medium sized, super performant in that in that specific domain. So I'm going to 
you know, index on having volume with a, with a smaller model because I can still get the right results. And then there are some cases where you want to have a very, very large model because you know you might have smaller volume, but you just want the correct information without any fine tuning. So that, that may be part of it. I think I have one more question. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so you how do you communicate and advocate your customers to follow best practices for addressing some of the problems like hallucination and bias? Like explore your data, recognize where your biases are. When some of your customers might prefer an off-the-shelf solution that gets them to a product that gets them to a solution quickly, and you recognize that maybe they're missing a few steps. Yeah, so I think we have a couple of examples of customers um, that I know of that have gone to market very, very quickly. Um, in an intent to be first to market. And I think one of the things is thinking, we have to continue to coach and provide that, that guidance. I think that we are all developing assessments to help customers best understand, you know, garbage in, garbage out in this world too, right? But also the responsible AI practices. The other thing is market differentiation. If I can go on my phone and ask the question, uh, and it's free, and yet the same response that you are now putting as part of your commercial uh, you know, entity, there's no market differentiation. And so that's what we saw very early, you know, generative AI, tutor chatbots on learning content that was freely available, uh, but you're gonna put a subscription on it, but I can get the same thing on my phone, right? So I think part of it is helping them understand there's a commercial implication for rushing to market, and then there are technical ways to enhance accuracy to, uh, you know, that RIG architecture I mentioned also allows you to cite sources and have that documentation, which is critically important both on the academic side and certainly on the commercial side as well, and I think will be more and more important going forward. So there's a technical approach and then there's a, the, the commercial viability of a product, a product that is undifferentiated in the market. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.